Like for me, it just felt like it was there to be there so that it could be controversial, so that it could be shocking. It just feels like, do you remember when you were growing up and you were first a teenager and you wanted to show everybody that you were like more mature now, that you were more edgy, so you just started saying fuck for the sake of it? Woof woof! Hey guys, it's me Marcus, aka The Mad Dog, and thank you for tuning in to another video. So this one's going to be another review about a book that I recently read, and in case you can't read the title or in case you can't see over my shoulder, this is going to be about Joker by Brian Azzarello and Lee Bermejo. You might as well just do us all a favour and add that to the list of names that I can't pronounce correctly. But you might recognise this creative team because they have worked together on the past and the other story that they did, which is included in this beautiful Absolute Edition that I got as a gift from my um, girlfriend, The Shadow Cat, they did another story about another supervillain and um, Lex Luthor. And in case you're wondering to kind of immediately address the elephant in the room, no, this is not based on the film starring Joaquin Phoenix. This is set in continuity, so it's Gotham, there's Batman, there's other characters throughout the DC universe. And during this coming out, there was quite a good critical reception of it. It was getting quite high reviews, especially for the first couple of issues, and since then it's been collected in multiple editions. So I wanted to sit down with it, give it a thorough read through, and I'm here today with my thoughts and my complete review of the entire book. This is going to be mostly spoiler free, there's going to be one part where I'm going to talk about a specific scene in particular. That's going to be time stamped so you can just look at the bottom and know when to skip. But in case you didn't have time for all this, I'm going to do my Too Long Didn't Watch, which is where I tell you about the book as quick as I can so you can just get on with the rest of your day. It's an intriguing and unique snapshot into the Joker in the kind of world that he's built for himself, but there's very little beyond whimsy and it doesn't really crack the surface of the title character. If that's all the review that you needed and you don't need to watch any of the rest of the video, please just make sure that you give this video a thumbs up and you subscribe if you haven't done so already and click that bell notification. But for the rest of you who want a more in-depth review, let's just get into it starting with the plot. So even though this book's called Joker, it follows this character of Johnny Frost. He's this low level thug in Gotham City who's got some of his own personal troubles and he's trying to make a bit of a name for himself. So he joins a crime syndicate and the first job that he's got to do is pick up the Joker who's now recently been released from Arkham Asylum. Johnny effectively becomes his chauffeur and we see the Joker starting to warm up to him and begin to like him as they go through the days together. But as expected with a character like the Joker, you've always got this sense that you don't know if it's genuine or if it is that he's just using Johnny for his own advantage. And by enlisting in the help of Harley Quinn, Penguin and Killer Croc and some other characters in the universe, the Joker seeks to reclaim all the turf and all the money that he felt that he lost out on during his time in Arkham Asylum. However, Two-Face stands in his way. Working almost as a double agent, we see Johnny have meetings with Two-Face who's feeding him information and trying to taint his perspective and tells Johnny that the Joker's eventually going to try and kill him. This forces Johnny to question where his allegiances really lie and the rest of the story is following Johnny as he's trying to toe the line between these two warring factions, both of whom are trying to claim different parts of Gotham for themselves. At the same time, Johnny's trying to bring this balance between his criminal life and the personal life that he's got, but more than anything, he's just trying to find a way to make some money, survive, and also keep his sanity in check. So let's talk a bit about the art, and let's just be honest with each other. The main reason most of us brought this is because of that beautiful art throughout this book. Lieber Mayo is something else. He's like this perfect middle ground between the likes of Alex Ross, but also the likes of a sort of Eduardo Risso. Like when I'm trying to describe it, I can't entirely say it's a realistic style, but in the same flip of the coin, I can't really say that it's entirely comic-y. It's completely its own thing, it's abstract, and I think that's what gives life to this book. With a character like the Joker, you need something that's abstract because he isn't traditional in his own right. So it makes sense that you've got somebody that you can't really put your finger on exactly what it is that makes his art pop. So I think he was a great choice for this book and I personally preferred it when his art was uncoloured. Because sometimes I think when that colouring was added and the inking was added, it kind of made a lot of his figures look a little bit plasticky. And this came out in 2008 and the biggest thing about the Joker in 2008 was the Dark Knight film and the portrayal by Heath Ledger. From looking at these designs I do get the feeling like Heath Ledger's portrayal had some kind of influence on this project. And I like that when I looked at this Joker I got the sense that there was a human being underneath all the makeup and underneath all the clothes. Which I really like because I feel like the Joker's become such an entity that he's become bigger than himself and we can often forget that there is a human that's just lost his way. And with a character like the Joker it becomes a hundred times more scary when you do realise that he's a person just like you, that you could just be like him if you just have one bad day. One thing that I really liked about Bermejo is that he seemed to know when to add detail. So in some panels you'd be able to see so much more of Gotham, there'd be grime on the walls, there'd be rubbish in the streets, you could see buildings 
stretching on for miles or you could see the ripples in the water. But then in other panels, there'd be a complete absence of background. You'd just see the two characters talking and it feels so much more intense. So I feel like there's a lot to like about the art, but if you're more into a traditional style of comic art, I don't really think this would be for you. However, if you do tend to like the styles of more crime noir thrillers, if you like your Sean Phillipses, your Eduardo Rissos, or you like the realism of someone like Alex Ross, I think you'd get a kick out of looking through this book. So to get onto the actual review of the story, I found myself in a midpoint when it comes to this book because there was a lot that I liked and that I really enjoyed but I just didn't find myself engaging with the focal point of this story. I just didn't resonate with Johnny Frost, I didn't find him interesting enough. The reason why I wanted to read this book Joker is because of the Joker, not because of Johnny Frost. And I just felt like it never did anything interesting, like if you would have told me that we were getting a story about one of the Joker's side crew and how they work with him, it probably would have gone the exact way in the book that we've got here. From issue one it's clear that the Joker doesn't really have any loyalty or respect for anyone that he works with and that extinguished any kind of stakes that we had during this book. Additionally and I'm not going to spoil it for you here but the book kind of does make you question it throughout. I just didn't care if Johnny survived or not. However on the flip side of that Harvey Dent coin I do think the book took the most logical and best approach for a story like this because the smartest thing to do with the Joker story is to not actually focus it from the perspective of the Joker. You do kind of need somebody who's looking in on him rather than being in the Joker's shoes. Because we've kind of got a Schrodinger's cat situation when it comes to the Joker. Because we want to find out what makes him tick because he's such an interesting mystery when it comes to him as a character. But if we were to find out what makes him tick we wouldn't be interested in him anyway. It's the not truly knowing aspect which makes him interesting and makes people buy books like this. And to know the whole three Jokers thing became canon after this book came out and it's not even known if this book is canon to begin with. I felt that it really incorporated all three of those personalities of the Joker within these five issues. So you got to see him as a common thief, you got to see him as the clown prince of crime, and there was also elements where he was the homicidal maniac, so you had elements of all three of those Jokers coming out across this story. And there were scenes when you genuinely didn't know if the Joker was just going to burst out laughing or if he was just going to shoot up an entire club. A lot of it really reminded me of the scene in Goodfellas with Joe Pesci and the whole you think I'm funny kind of scene. I haven't seen that film in years, I really need to watch it again. But that uncertainty was what carried the majority of this book and the tension rather than what what we think might happen to Johnny. And now that I think of it, and it makes sense because it was Brian Azzarello who's writing it, who also did 100 Bullets, there was a lot of that crime noir aspects that came out. So it did have this mafia angle that was similar to Godfather, Goodfellas or Scarface. And I also thought the inclusion of other characters that we already know exist in Gotham was great as well. I like how the Penguin was utilised and he didn't really come across as overpowered like he can do sometimes when he's in other stories. Like the Penguin is somebody that you'd just completely walk over the second that you got chance to. And Two-Face being positioned as the antagonist rather than Batman was a welcome surprise. Because it would have been so typical to make it that it's a story about Joker vs Batman, but then you've got Two-Face who we already know is a villain. And because the other person is the Joker, Two-Face actually becomes the more reasonable of the two. And you actually get the sense that he really wants Johnny to just do well and be safe. Because my favourite thing about Two-Face is that tragedy between Harvey Dent and his alter ego. You always had the sense that he was a good guy and that Harvey Dent always wants to come back through and take over his own body. So having those moments actually reminded you of the tragedy of what makes that character so good to begin with. I felt Harley Quinn was a bit underused and just sort of there to tick a box because it's a Joker story so of course Harley would show up somewhere but admittedly I'm one of the people that I think Harley Quinn is now overused so it's nice for her to just sort of be a subtle background character rather than just being shoved down your throat like she is today. However up until now it's been spoiler free and there's one scene that I do have to talk about when I'm reviewing this book. I wouldn't be doing it justice to not talk about this but if you don't want any spoilers at all I'd recommend that you skip to the timestamp below and just go to my final thoughts. And I'm not kidding, the next sentence that I'm about to say is 100% a spoiler. So if you don't want that, leave now. There is a rape scene in this book that serves absolutely no purpose. Now you don't see the actual act, but you see the build up and you see the immediate aftermath and it's very clear what's happened. It's not one of those implied things either. You literally see the Joker leaving the back seat of the car, doing up his trousers and a woman in a ruined dress crying in the back seat. And don't get me wrong, I'm not one of those soy boy type of dudes who thinks that rape's this thing that can never be brought into fiction 
position that it's the one sort of taboo of all of literature. And yes, it's an awful crime and I think all rapists should be killed, like genuinely bring back the death penalty for people who rape. But there are dozens of other horrible crimes that are a staple of storytelling so I can't really have this double standard where I'm like, yeah you can murder babies in your books but you can't rape anyone. But the thing for me is does having this narrative device in your story add anything to it or is it solely for shock value? And yes, you could argue that Azarello was trying to make a point of the fact that the Joker does all of these horrible crimes, he murders people without a second thought, and we're just okay with it, he's still a fan favourite and beloved character, but all of a sudden if you put this thing in, does it change your perspective of him? Because it is just adding to that fact that he is a horrible person, which is something that we already knew. But for some reason, rape just is on a different level, and I think it's mainly because of that aftermath. And to give you the context and to help justify my perspective, the rape happened because the Joker is annoyed that Johnny was going behind his back and talking to Two-Face. So they saved Johnny's ex-wife who hasn't really had a massive role in this other than just being some kind of like backstory for Johnny and they bring her in quite close to the end just so that she can be raped so that the Joker can teach Johnny a lesson. It doesn't lead to the Joker's downfall, Johnny doesn't really ever think about it again and it's never really brought up in the rest of the book. So what was the point in doing it? On a similar note there's Rape in Watchmen which is a book that I'm reading currently for like the ninth time but the comedian in that rapes one of the other female characters. But there it actually served a purpose for the story, it wasn't just showing you rape so that you knew that rape still existed in the world, it was there to show you a why a lot of people hate the comedian and it also sets up a lot of future plot points in the rest of the book. Whereas here if you deleted that one page where it happened nothing else in the story would have been different. Like for me it just felt like it was there to be there so that it could be controversial so that it could be shocking, it just feels like, do you remember when you were growing up and you were first a teenager and you wanted to show everybody that you were like more mature now, that you were more edgy so you just started saying fuck for the sake of it, so you'd fucking say fuck every fucking chance that you'd fucking get to fucking say fuck because you could fucking say fuck now that you were a fucking adult. So this channel's never getting monetized. Well it's the equivalent of The Last of Us 2 just being depressing so that it seemed more profound and that it could convince itself that it had a deeper level of context and subtext. Actually, and I don't mean to keep banging on about it, but it is the main thing that I remember from this book and I think it just kind of tells you the type of book that this is. But I remember when I was at university, I did a creative writing class and there were people in there that just wanted to show that they were such an emotional writer, that they had such a depth when it came to their creative writing skills. So they'd always try to just write stuff that was sad, everything just had to be sad and about the depths of sadness. And to do that, everybody would just write about the war and it would always be about a war that they weren't even alive during, or they'd always write a story about an old person having dementia. Because yeah, of course those things are sad, but realistically, it's only sad because of the thing that it is in essence. It's not sad because of your writing in the same way that this isn't deep because it's got rape in it. Because it's a cheap tactic to achieve your goal in the same way that rape is in this. Yes, we know the Joker's despicable, but you could have shown us that in a more creative way, rather than just resorting to the easiest thing that you could have done to make us realise how disgusting and despicable and vile this character is. So my final verdict is that this was an interesting short story, but if you were looking for something that explores the complex relationship between the Batman and Joker from the villain's perspective, you are going to be disappointed with this. This is not a Batman story in any way, it is 100% solely a Joker story. Batman is more of a special guest star in this, and I think it's interesting for the perspective of the Joker going against Two-Face, and if you did want a story about Gotham where crime's running rampant, then this would be for you. But admittedly, if that was what you were looking for, I'd be more inclined to recommend Gotham's Central, which I think handled that exact premise in a much better way and it did it for a longer strand of narrative. However, the book's only five issues long, so even if you don't enjoy it, it's not going to take up too much of your time. I read this in about two sittings, it was a really quick read that I think I banged out in about a day. And I can see people who like crime stories more than superhero stories getting a really good kick out of this. And even if the story isn't for you, that art though. And I think I'm going to leave this review there. I do hope that you enjoyed it and if you did please remember to give this a thumbs up and if you didn't like this video why did you get this far? If you've read this book what did you think about it? Leave it in the comment section below and if you are going to include spoilers that's fine but just make sure that you label it with spoilers before so you don't ruin it for anyone. Please share this video with any groups that might enjoy it just so that you can get more mad dogs on the scene and if you haven't done so already please make sure that you click that subscribe button and click the bell notification so that you never miss a video. Check out my Facebook page and my Instagram so that you can keep up to date with all things that's happening on this channel. But more than anything, just make sure that you stay safe, keep reading and keep barking all you mad dogs and I'll see you at the next video.